My name is Caitlin Pankey. I am a bilingual speech and language pathologist in the district, for those of you who don't know me. I see a lot of new faces. So um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how to provide some bilingual intervention even if you only speak English. So, um, or any other language that differs from the student that you're working with. Um, so the first page in your packet has to do with a study that kind of makes the case for bilingual intervention. Um, the study focuses on a student who was kindergarten aged at the time of the study and his family was from Iceland. Um, he had been uh, diagnosed with significant language delays in preschool and at the time of diagnosis um, the speech path had actually recommended that he get therapy only in English. Um, so for at least a year or two um, by the time the study started he had been receiving intervention solely in English. And as a result, he kind of had um, limited communication with his family, with his extended family. Um, so as they got ready to prepare this case, they suggested bilingual intervention because they noticed that English intervention really wasn't working for this child. Um, and they talked about the reasons for uh, suggesting bilingual interventions. Um, this is a study out of Canada. and. Um, According to Wikipedia, 1,400 people in all of Canada speak Icelandic, so I'm guessing that the clinician didn't really have the option of speaking Icelandic herself for himself. Um, but they wanted to pursue bilingual therapy anyway because the parents didn't speak English well enough to serve as a real accurate model for the child. Um, they couldn't do therapy only in Icelandic because this child is just getting ready for school and he will need English for school and for social settings. And they really wanted to encourage this child to use language as a child with language delay. We already know that you know language is hard, and so to limit that by saying we just want you to speak in English is really difficult for our kids with language delays. Um, and then also, just in general, a positive attitude towards bilingualism, acceptance, encouragement of use of both languages will really foster overall language learning, which is our goal, right? So. Um, so you know that kind of sets the case for good reasons why we know that bilingual intervention is most likely the way to go. Um, but as I said, from reading about this case and from what we know about demographics, it's unlikely that this clinician spoke Icelandic. So what do you do if you know that it's best to provide intervention in both languages, but you don't have resources to speak that other language? Um, an interpreter, as we all know, is best practice if you do not speak the language yourself. Um, we all also know that that's not always an option in the school environments, therapy environments. Um, maybe there's a very, very small population of people who speak that language at all in the whole country. Um, you can also use a cultural broker, and that could be a parent, could be a grandparent, it could be a community member. But the idea behind a cultural broker is that they are going to give you some information about the culture of the student that you're working with that you don't have. So um, whether that be language, customs, what's considered appropriate, you're going to use that person to help you bridge that gap. Um, if you do not have access to either an interpreter or a cultural broker, which will happen sometimes, I know here in the district we have some students who speak African languages, who speak Asian languages, that it's incredibly difficult to find somebody to act in that role for you. Um, I would say, you know, show interest in the language, um, you know, tell them how cool it is that they're bilingual. Um, even when I speak Spanish with students, I make sure and tell them that, you know, I didn't learn it until I was 11, and you're five and you already speak Spanish, and you're always going to be better at it than me. And they look at me and they're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> you're always going to be better at it if you keep it up. Um, and then also, if you're able at all to provide home language, um, home materials in their language, that's also a great thing. Um, there's a little bit more availability because you could do things by email if you wanted things translated and um, someone is not available to do it in person for you to get those things sent home for your students. Um, and then on that third page there, there's just a reminder that um, the real take home message from this study for me was that the goal for a bilingual child is not to learn a language of therapy, but to learn language. So, you know, any language, any time, as long as they're using language, we should be celebrating it. Um, all right, so uh, another part of bilingual intervention is of course providing them some support in English. Um, assuming that the child has been evaluated in both of their languages to determine el eligibility, uh, a part of that that might be lacking is really their present level in English, uh, especially for a lot of our younger children. Uh, you might have a real good description of their home language. Um, 
but you still need to know what their present level is in English. Uh, this present level is not so much about IEP documentation because we know that describing their present level in English isn't really telling us about their disability, it's telling us about their English proficiency, but it's still something that you need to know in order to accurately give them therapy and to support them as a whole child. Um, so uh, there are a lot of different ways to determine English proficiency uh, and most of the descriptions right now divide English proficiency into six levels. Uh, there's a basic description of the six levels of second language acquisition. Um, the first is pre-production, which we also call the silent period. And a lot of our students who are having their first experience not only with school but with English as well uh, will come to us in this period. Um, and this can be an incredibly difficult one to figure out how to access English at all in therapy because they are in something that's called the silent period. Um, it can last six weeks or longer. It really depends on the individual. Um, it depends on their bilingual background. Um, but it will help you to identify that so you can kind of work with them and, and maybe target receptive skills first because you know that this is where they're at and they just need some time to move on to the next stage. And this uh, is for children that are non-disabled and disabled. Of yes. This acquisition. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And this, and this goes along with the access test levels? Mm -hmm. Yep, we're going to talk about how it aligns with access next. But yeah, this is just kind of a basic um, description. But yeah, access test scores also have six levels. So everything kind of connects to this as you start to look at uh, all the ways to measure English proficiency. Um, after the pre-production period is the early production. Um, they might start saying short words, sentences. A lot of my little kids love to talk about shoes, even if that's the only let word they have in English. Um, they will start to show you the things that they think are fun to say in their second language. Uh, after that, they'll move on to speech emergent, where they might start to give you those little phrases, I want something. Um, all depends on, on what they most need to communicate with you. Um, beginning fluency is when you see that social speech and you may start to get confused as to why a student is still having academic difficulty in English because socially they're seeming to do very well and to have really developed those English skills. Um, but that academic vocabulary, um, different contexts will still show you that, that uh, English is still very much their second language. Um, the fifth stage is intermediate fluency. And that is, again, you're going to see more fluency in social situations, um, but you're also going to see uh, uh, increasing fluency in areas that they're very familiar with. So maybe they've got really gotten their science and math vocab down, history vocabulary may still be difficult for them. There are still going to be areas of weakness, but you're going to keep on seeing those strengths increasing. And then the last stage is advanced fluency. Um, for most English as a second language programs, if they stay in the advanced fluency stage for two years and are monitored within that stage, they would then be exited from English as a second language services. So advanced fluency is our, our goal for students who speak English as a second language. It's, it's the end goal for support services. Um, going on to how that applies in our district, we use the access test. Uh, ACCESS stands for Assessing Comprehension and Communication in English State to State. I did not know that until I made this presentation. <laughs> um, and there are six levels of English proficiency. And just going through them, you can see how they um, connect to the stages that we just went through. The entering, beginning, developing, expanding, bridging, and then reaching is that end goal for the ACCESS test. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, looking at a child's access number doesn't tell you a lot. They range from 1.0 to 6.0, and that first number will tell you where a student is at in terms of their English proficiency, but that second number will actually tell you what their skills are within the whole spectrum of things they can do in English. Um, the World Class Instructional Design and Assessment, is they are the makers of the access test. And in conjunction with that, they've made a list called the can-do descriptors, um, which is really what everyone should be using instead of the access test to tell them what, where their students are at. Um, can-do descriptors are divided into grade ranges, and they um, 
they do exactly what they say they do. They list what the student can do in English. Uh, they're divided into uh, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. And um, they're a really great resource when you're trying to figure out where a student is at in English and how you can bridge some therapy goals across two languages. Um, and also, the can-do descriptors remind me that, um, you know, I often hear speech paths say, you know, but I'm not an English as a second language teacher. But we are kind of, because we know that our students with language delay are going to need more exposure, more instruction to get any form of language, both content and use. And so English is going to be part of their lives as bilingual speakers. Um, and so we are kind of English as a second language teachers because they need it. So we need to figure out what level they're at so that we can give our students what they need. Can, um, yes. I had this somewhere, but where do I get the rest of the grade levels, the can-do list on the rest the of the grade? The can-do list, if you Google search for WIDA can-do descriptors, you should get a whole list of all the grade levels. All right, thank you. And yeah, they are great. So um, on this slide, I just kind of gave you a, um, a list of the listening and speaking can-do descriptors for preschool through kindergarten. And they go all the way from preschool through 12th grade. Um, so the way I would use this is it's a rubric system and you can find where your student is at in terms of their access score um, and then uh, again like I said that second number is going to tell you if they're closer to the next level or if they're still really um, strongly within that level so anything 0.5 and below you know they're still working on skills within that box as they get mm -hmm. up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. They're getting closer and closer to that next level, and that will help you determine how you can challenge your students as well um, with what they're going to get next. Uh, as I was looking through these and really typing them out, um, it struck me that at access level three is when you can follow two-step directions in English. Um, and I think we really underestimate that, you know, our students need to be that, at that level in order, to, um, in order to be able to show us that they can follow just two-step directions in English. Um, so the next portion I went through and I came up with some language activities that will benefit your students at all proficiencies and across their languages. Uh, one of the things that you can do is to teach vocabulary using cognates. Uh, cognates work best if you're working with a student who has two languages that are related linguistically. So Spanish and English have about 30 to 40 percent of words that will come up as cognates. If you're working with a student whose first language is Chinese or Hmong or an African language, cognates are not going to be so useful. But um, English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, um, those ones that kind of have a lot of common roots could be really useful in helping students make connections between their two languages. Um, false cognates are also an important part of teaching cognates. Um, cognates is a really great strategy, but if students are not shown that there's also false cognates, they can depend on it a little bit too much and make some embarrassing mistakes. I know a lot of people have done it in Spanish. Um, embarazada does not mean embarrassed in Spanish, it means pregnant. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so yeah, pointing out how the context can really impact things and, and that you really need to double check what you know about cognates will help your students as well. Um, related to using cognates um, is teaching root words. Um, and actually, root words is now something that is um, very much emphasized in the Common Core State Standards. Uh, so you can use the Common Core State Standards to say why you're working on root words with one of your students. Um, again, because it's based on cognates, it works best for related languages. Um, but English and Spanish both have a lot of words that come from Greek and Latin. And if they have the same Greek and Latin root word, they're going to have very similar words in both the languages. Um, so I just listed some Common Core State standards that would, uh, in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, that would allow you to really tie in the academics to working on this skill with your students. Um, in first grade, children are asked to identify frequently occurring root words and their inflectional forms. Um, and then in second grade, they're asked to use a known root word as a clue to the meaning of an unknown word with the same root. So that, uh, the chart next to it that shows you you know, bio is the root meaning life in Greek, 
Um, in English, we say biology. In Spanish, they say biología. So that will really be an easy way for our students to, to make those connections. On the next page, I talk about pre-teaching vocabulary for specific occasions. Uh, this can help kids both academically and socially. Um, if you know a field trip is coming up, uh, taking a couple weeks beforehand to teach children the vocabulary they're going to need to talk about the experience in English will very much benefit them. Um, they'll be able to talk about the experience with their friends and peers as it's happening. And then, as we know, field trips uh, are going to tie into tell me what your favorite experience was, let's all write about what we did at the farm yesterday. So students are asked to, to do a lot of things around those experiences and having the right words in English is really going to help them to be able to be successful in those tasks. Um, as well, it's a really nice opportunity for some dynamic assessment if you're unsure how fast a student is able to learn language, if you would like to know, um, you know just what their overall language learning skills are, uh, to take a baseline of the vocabulary that they know before you start and then to progress monitor to them weekly will give you a really good idea of how they're progressing and some, some hard data, you know, uh, it, even though it's in English, because it has to do with how they're learning and not what they already knew. Um, connected to that is teaching content area academic vocabulary. Um, for younger students, this is gonna be a lot of the basic concepts and category work. Um, Working with kids on colors, body parts, clothes will really help them to be able to um, talk about what's going on in their classroom. Um, descriptions and adjectives can be a really helpful uh, skill for kids to, um, to master. I, I listed a couple websites that have some great resources in Spanish to help you in all those categories. Uh, and then also as students get older, you're going to switch to more of that, what the Common Core calls Tier 2 vocabulary, which are kind of the common verbs that you see throughout subject areas that if you don't know what they mean, you're not going to be able to show what you know, even if you have that information. So verbs like identify, infer, compare, and contrast. And there's also a website that has um, a variety of songs and activities to teach that vocabulary. It's all in English, but I find that music can be a pathway in even if the student's English proficiency isn't quite high enough to um, understand the whole meaning. Um, and then the second to last page there, I just talked about teaching vocabulary using a variety of fiction and nonfiction texts. Um, even if it's not possible to read the child a book in their native language, if you can go over a couple of key vocabulary words in their native language, that will really help them access the content. Um, if you're looking for books that might have a couple more cognates to help you bridge their vocabulary knowledge, um, nonfiction actually has more cognates than a fiction story would. Um, and then also, you know, get creative and really check out the things around you. If your school gets the REIT Farm to School snacks, they actually email out things about the snacks each week, and it's in English and Spanish. And because it's a direct translation, it's really easy to go in and look at the English one and pick out the words in Spanish and talk to your students about, about a lot of nonfiction topics like winter storage crops, plant propagation, things that I don't know how to say in Spanish, but they help me. <laughs> Um, and then when focusing on just single word exposure to the native language, if you're worried about your pronunciation, um, if you have some Spanish but not a lot, uh, Google Translate will actually say things for you. So if you put the word into Google and ask it to translate it to Spanish, on the, the, on the side of the screen where they have um, listed the Spanish word for you, there will be a speaker icon under that. And if you click on it, it will read the word for you in a beautiful accent, much better than mine is. Um, and the last page is just a couple resources, um, mainly English and Spanish because <coughs> that's the area I know the most about. Uh, the first one is a list of 50 bilingual books and it's great because it gives you a whole bunch of different areas like poetry and alphabet books. Um, those can be a little bit difficult to find because they can't be translated. You know, if you take A is for Apple and you translate it directly to Spanish, it no longer starts with A. So um, it's nice to find good resources in those areas so that you can still work on phonemic and phonological awareness skills without losing the meaning there. 